So how does sociology inform the advocacy and activism that you and others engage in? Well, I mean, I think historical sociology is the most indispensable mode of inquiry in the modern world alongside poetry and music. To understand who we are requires understanding the emergence, sustenance, and even decline of different structures, different institutions, and the way in which they shape individuals and agents in the world. And so when you think of modernity, you're really thinking about capitalist commodification, you're thinking about a form of rationalization in the Weberian sense, you're thinking about objectification the way Zimmel talked about it, and you're certainly thinking about the emergence of the nation state the way Weber and others define that institution as having a monopoly on instrumentalities of violence and various institutions of administration regarding public services. There's no way of understanding who we are without understanding historical sociology. So you sure. went to Charlottesville, Virginia to protest the alt-right, and I wonder how do you define the alt-right and why is it important to challenge them? Yes, you know, I don't even accept, I think, the alt-right category. I really don't. I think neo-fascists are neo-fascists. Uh, they come in different forms, different incarnations and iterations. You know, we have to be suspicious of the very categories because it becomes a way of of downplaying the continuities of figures in the past. Yes, there's going to be some discontinuities for those in the past, but there's some continuities. If someone were to come to me and say, I'm alt-left. No, I'm not alt-left. I'm left. You know, when I love C. Wright Mills, he's not all left. He's left. <laughs> du Bois, he's left. Now, what is to be left? Well, the left was a suspicion of various kind of hierarchies, imperial hierarchies, class, gender, uh, trying to keep track of the vicious forms of transphobia and homophobia uh, in the world as persons and as intellectuals. My going to Charlottesville was the same as going to Standing Rock, is the same as standing with my, my trans comrades are standing with my feminist comrades are standing with my my black comrades it's a certain kind of moral wit as a uh, revolutionary Christian I, I take the spiritual dimension very seriously too and what I mean by that is that there there ought to be a certain joy in struggle there ought to be a certain zest and gusto that one gets from putting oneself on the line that is then refiltered through one's writing so that the writing that you do is rooted in the risks that you take and that's manifest in the kind of fruits that you bear. So there's a debate in the academy about whether and when academics should engage in activism. And I wondered, what's your perspective on this debate? Well, one, I think it's an individual choice. I don't think there's one model for everybody. Uh, at the same time, uh, there's different streams and strands within the great tradition of scholarship and sociology. You think of uh, Weber, Durkheim, Marx, I think of Du Bois, Simone de Beauvoir, I think of Sinclair Drake, William Julius Wilson. One has a lot of different models to choose from. All of those towering figures don't conform to one model. The question is, you know, what's the quality of the critical intelligence that is manifest in the work done in the narrow academic context and the broader public context? Because the quality of the work and the depth of the insights, it's the scope of the illumination that makes the difference, it seems to me. I'm glad that John Rawls spent as much time as he did writing theories of justice in an ivory tower. So even though I have deep disagreements, he's got some illuminations and raising some questions that's very important. On the other hand, I'm glad Sheldon Wolin did what he did. He wrote both academic and he wrote for the popular uh, uh, context. And so you want a variety of different voices. That's in the context of political theory. Uh, in sociology, it would be the same, same thing, it seems to me. The problem is, is that uh, sociology as a discipline becomes so professionalized and specialized and becomes so differentiated from larger publics as it becomes part of professional managerial sites in the university, that quantitative analysis, trying to emulate the natural sciences, trying to emulate physics and, and other uh, uh, fields that have a tremendous prowess, tremendous status, can take sociology away from asking some of the deeper, more profound questions about what it is to be human 
how do we create societies? How do you promote individuality? How do individuals relate to one another? How do you deal with the stranger and the alien? All of those deep questions that Marx and Zimmel and Lukács and Durkheim and Weber and De Beauvoir and Du Bois and Sinclair Drake and others ask. The professionals want to appear a certain way, have a certain kind of image, a certain kind of spectacle status, and that downplays. That's just foliage. But it downplays fruit. You see, and fruit is a biblical notion. It goes back to Hebrew scripture. It goes back to uh, the legacy of Jerusalem. And that fruit is not just results in a cost-benefit analysis. It's not just effects in a utilitarian analysis. It's a joy that has to do with living a certain kind of life. The reward structure of the profession generates a conformity. It generates not just a complacency, but what Danielle Allen talks about in her recent powerful book called Cuz, of the ways in which academicians use abstraction and distance as a way of protecting themselves from taking risk in the world. You see, for me, that's a form of uh, a refusal of a certain kind of spiritual maturity because they're scared, they're afraid. They allow a certain kind of careerism to impede their acting on their vocation or their calling, you see, if they have such a calling, you see. And it's a human battle that's waged on the, the soul of each and every one of us, kind of like a civil war. It doesn't make sense to me for somebody to have a radical sociological experience, analysis, with a neoliberal soul craft. Hmm. The neoliberal soul craft is, I want to be smart, I want to be rich, I want to have high visibility, and I'm, a down, and I'm going to overlook the bombs that the American empire drops with drone strikes on Somalia or Afghanistan or Pakistan and so forth. So that the soul craft has to do, no, you have a radically democratic soul craft in which you get a certain joy of telling the truth, joy of bearing witness, a certain zest in engaging in, you know, Noam Chomsky is a good example of that, to, to be oppositional for so long and still have a smile on his face. I just went him the other night. He's almost 90 years old and he still has this joy of trying to tell the truth. They ain't been treating him like I don't know what in terms of his critiques of the empire, his critiques of U.S. foreign policy and what have you, you see. And that makes a difference. And of course, that kind of joy is available to anybody. It's not available to just religious people or non-religious and so forth and so on. But there's no doubt that looking at it through the lens of the legacy of Jerusalem, the Rabbi Heschel, I think, is quite useful here. It does provide a certain conception of what it is to be human while one is an intellectual in the academy so that you're willing to bear witness without being concerned about the approval of your colleagues or the approval of what the elites in your profession think or what prizes you might or might not win and so on. What advice do you have for sociology given that? Well, I think, you know, you, you, you follow the, uh, the best of your tradition. And the best of your tradition has to do with uh, 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 the uh, acuteness of your analysis, the subtlety and sophistication uh, of your analysis, but tied to a radical democratic vision. I mean, one of my favorites, of course, is C. Wright Mills. He always is a kind of a soulmate. You know, I wrote about him with American Vision philosophy and his relation to American pragmatism, his dissertation on sociology and pragmatism. But what I loved about uh, C. Wright Mills and his classic, The Sociological Imagination, I think written about 59 or so, is that he knew that as an intellectual and a sociologist, that he had a commitment to public interest, common good, and he understood it in a transnational way. As part of his connections with Cuba and critiques of the American empire had to do with his concern about people around the world, not just in the United States. Uh, so he has always been an exemplary figure for me. Now he's got a lot of limitations. He's in love with Thorsten Veblen. He valorizes the self-independent uh, individual uh, uh, in the American tradition that, that, that mean the world to him. I come out of a very different uh, uh, tradition in that sense. I'm, I'm much more tied to a John Dewey than a Veblen. But 
I love C. Wright Mills' work and his witness.